is KGW News at Noon. A federal judge in Florida struck down the national mask mandate for public transportation on Monday and within a few hours, some of the country's largest airlines also dropped mask requirements on their planes. Welcome to the news at noon. I'm Drew Carney and our top story this afternoon is the fallout and the reaction from this decision to drop masks at the airport. PDX released a statement about the decision and here's what part of it said. Local TSA just advised us they'll no longer be enforcing the directive that requires masking in the airport. To that end, people in the airport are not required to wear a face covering. That statement continued with these words. We recognize that travelers and airport employees will have mixed feelings about this sudden change. We ask that people be kind and respectful of a person's individual decision to wear a mask or not wear a mask. The federal judge's ruling on this still leaves it up to individual airlines and transit agencies to decide what to do on their end of things. Already though, some of the big airlines, including Alaska, Delta and Southwest, have come forward and said that masks are also now optional on their planes. We talked to some travelers at PDX. Some were happy about this news. Others though said they're still concerned, especially on board a plane. Why take a high, why take the risk if you don't? really need to. I mean, especially when you're in like a tube in the air for so long with others around you. I've had two shots and two boosters and I don't feel I need it and I'm really happy to be done with it. I think it's time to move on. I was just elated. I mean, it was just so good to hear that we don't have to wear this anymore. It's worth noting that some airlines may still require masks, so it's worth checking ahead of time to make sure. But we have heard from TriMet and C-Tran, and both are now making masks optional on their buses and trains. All right, we'll get back to local headlines in just a moment, but Rod, we want to check in with you in the Weather Center. What's the story with the rain today? Well, uh, the rain doesn't seem to be optional. It's just out there for all of <laughs> us. It has been, for the most part, just a, a widespread, steady, rainy Tuesday so far. You see the moisture is still coming uh, on shore and right back in here. We talked about this this morning on sunrise. We're tracking uh, an upper level disturbance that is going to continue to push in. And here's the rain out ahead of that disturbance right now. The back end of it has cleared Newport, but still steady rain from Salem up into Portland. And again, the northern edge of the rain uh, has been up through uh, Vancouver. Haven't had much rain this morning at all up in Longview. We still have snow levels that are down just above 2,000 feet, it looks like. Here's Futurecast, 2 p.m. this afternoon, the tail end of that rain, still producing uh, moisture in the area, but by 4 o'clock, most of today's rain comes to an end. So there is some drier weather to be had coming our direction. We're only at 46 right now because the rain has just been relentless. So if we dry out somewhat, and it looks like we will later this afternoon, we'll keep the chance of a rumble of thunder alive. Warming temperatures with some drier weather has a chance to still get us up at least into the low 50s. We'll take a look at uh, the climbing rainfall totals for April coming up in just a bit, Drew. All right, more from Rod here in just a few minutes, like you said, but we do want to get back to some of those local headlines now. We start with a kidnapping attempt in Washougal last night, shortly after 7 p.m. So this is a map right here of the area where police say the attempt took place on the 300 block of 6th Street. Again, this is Washougal. Police say a 13 year old girl was walking home when a man started to chase after her and also tried to grab her. The girl was able to get away, though, and make it all the way home. Police are still looking for the suspect and they're asking anyone with information to contact them. Meanwhile, nurses at Providence St. Vincent Hospital start voting today on whether or not to go on strike. The voting is expected to take a few weeks. The nurses say they're looking for a few things, including better patient safety standards and paid leave. Providence says they've offered nurses a 9.5% raise and are trying to get the nurses union back to the negotiating table to continue those contract talks. And we're still waiting for more information about the two men who were shot by U.S. Marshals in Southeast Portland yesterday. The Marshals were trying to serve a warrant at the time, but we don't know exactly what led up to the shooting. One of the men who was shot was a fugitive from Washington. He and the other man that was shot are both recovering in the hospital. Two other people were also detained. And that's a look at some of today's local headlines. We want to give you an update this afternoon on the shooting that we told you about yesterday. A teenager was killed in the shooting and several other teens were hurt. This all happened in Southeast Portland. 
One sixty second and Stark is the location. It actually happened on Sunday night and police now believe it may have been a hit and run or part of me a drive by shooting. The David Douglas School District says two of its students were part of the shooting, including the teen who was killed. The district sent out a statement today and here's part of that statement. It says we are holding the families of all four victims deep in our thoughts and we acknowledge that this is a traumatic event for all of them and everyone who knows them. The district says school counselors are available to support students in the aftermath of the shooting. We also spoke to the grandmother of some of the teens who were shot and she told us they range in age from 14 to 17 years old. This next story comes from Northeast Portland, Northeast 33rd Drive, where a woman was sleeping inside an RV when it appears that someone set it on fire. Catherine Cook caught up with the survivor and she also talked to some of the neighbors there who came to her rescue. For most people, it's hard to imagine living in an RV parked along a busy road like Northeast 33rd Drive. Now imagine someone setting fire to your home while you were sleeping in it. Cherie Thomas de Clue. I got woke up to it. Doesn't have to imagine. And people yelling, telling me to get out of my motorhome because it was on fire. It was just before 5 a.m. Monday morning. All of a sudden, this truck came by. Neighbor Claire Riley says it was a yellow moving truck. She says someone inside tossed out an explosive device. Big fireball like that, and um, it rolled down. Which rolled underneath Cherie's motorhome. And it just, boom, explosion, and it smoke and fire. Claire yelled to her husband, Andrew, for help. Ran to my house, got some water, tried to pit it out. Another neighbor used a fire extinguisher to put out the flames. I mean, she could have died. If it, I would have had my uh, propane tank on, uh, it would have blown me up. Fortunately, Cherie and her dogs made it out safely, but there's a lot of damage. The explosion even blew out her front windshield. Andrew has since popped it back in. I'm very grateful. Police and arson investigators are asking anyone with information, video or photos to share it with detectives. Many in Portland are tired of these RVs and the trash and crime some out here are responsible for. I wish there was a different way, but tough times. People living out here tell me drivers often take aim at their property with BB guns and paintball guns, damaging their cars. One man says he was recently walking by when someone threw a canned beverage out their window, barely missing his head. We're not supposed to be out here, but it's not fair for them to be doing stuff like that to us, thinking that they're better than we are. When that There's a saying about them being one paycheck from, from being out here. Don't matter if we poor or homeless. So we all the same people is how I look at it. A request, even in these conditions, to be both human and kind. It could have been you instead of me. Someone could do it to your home like they did mine. In Northeast Portland, Catherine Cook, KGW News. Also this afternoon, we're still waiting for more details about President Biden's visit to Portland on Thursday. What we do know is that the president will talk about infrastructure while he's here. More specifically, the Build Back Better bill that passed last November. So we reached out to Oregon Senator Ron Wyden about that topic. He says Oregon is expected to get $1.2 billion from the Build Back Better bill over the next five years, as a matter of fact, and Washington will get about $1.8 billion. So infrastructure is so important to our quality of life, our economy, and you simply cannot have big league job creation with little league infrastructure. The I-5 bridge project is one that could see a big portion of that Build Back Better funding, but Senator Wyden said he's not sure if the president will address that specific project when he's here on Thursday. We also know that after he visits Portland, President Biden will make a stop in Seattle. And now to the latest in Ukraine. There are new signs that Russia may be launching its biggest assault yet on the eastern part of the country. Russia is intensifying its attacks in the Donbass region, which is known as Ukraine's industrial heartland. The Russian military also continues to take aim on the port city of Mariupol, along with other cities. The Pentagon is vowing to help, with officials saying that the U.S. will assist in training Ukrainians on large artillery.